Okay, are okay, we going to get underway? Um, it's a pity that nobody showed up because um, it's a bit of a coming out uh, party for, for Biaki. Uh, Biaki is an incredibly shy uh, person <laughs> and um, it, it just doesn't like the glare of uh, publicity. Um, he used to work for OMA, but that was too visible. <laughs> too many people could see him in, in the team. So formed the plot group in 2001. Um, but again, too much uh, spotlight. So he, st he started the big office 2005, which is in uh, Copenhagen and, and in New York. So still very, very afraid. Uh, and comes to you with a lot of nervousness, um, so please um, treat him really uh, gently. Um, uh, this is for sure somebody that thinks very small. Actually, this is, this is a great TV advertisement now. If you've seen this one about think small. Um, but anyway, uh, Biake. Thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, like a, a disclaimer, uh, this, uh, this lecture is announced with a, a, a verb, a gyre. It's, um, it's because uh, I wasn't anywhere to be reached uh, when we had to submit a title and a conspiracy in my, in my office among my colleagues built up to put me on the spot. Uh, apparently it's some um, uh, like bogus uh, verb by a great American poet uh, from the poet, poem about the, the Jabberwocky. And it's, it's essentially what the Jabberwocky does, but it has nothing to do with the next uh, hour of, uh, uh, of architecture. Um, uh, it's really nice to, uh, to be here. Uh, I actually came here uh, for the first time in, uh, uh, in 1999. I was like, uh, just graduated from uh, architecture school. Uh, and uh, Galia Solomonov invited me to uh, uh, a review uh, of her students. Uh, and um, uh, like one of the things I took home was that I noticed that uh, everybody, like all of the reviewers, had incredibly exotic accents. Uh, the, the only one that sounded like an American was Stephen Hall. Uh, so uh, like listening to like the mixture of sort of uh, Hebrew and Argentinian and French accents, uh, I sort of, uh, I got the idea that maybe uh, I could be the architect that sounds like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and, um, and I've sort of pursued that uh, linguistically ever since. Um, and then, then I actually came back in, uh, in 2005, uh, I think, uh, and gave a talk. And uh, because it's so long ago, seven years, I went a little bit uh, berserk uh, now, because uh, we actually have been quite productive the, the last couple of years. So I, I wedged in uh, quite, quite a few uh, things in the, in the next hour. But, but essentially, one of the main things that have happened, uh, uh, especially over the last two years, is that we, we started out, uh, let's say, 12 years ago together with uh, Julien, and, and seven years ago uh, uh, in the form of BIG uh, in, uh, in Copenhagen, operating out of uh, Scandinavia. Uh, and recently, uh, yeah, we actually right now in Copenhagen moving into this, uh, this nice factory uh, to, to find something in, uh, in Copenhagen that looks a little bit like New York. Uh, and, uh, and then we moved to, uh, to New York recently. Uh, this is one of my colleagues, uh, Lauren. Uh, actually, you'll see that this uh, hairdo is mandatory in, uh, uh, in the office. Um, and essentially, we've been sort of... a when you suddenly take something that has like, uh, emerged or evolved in a Scandinavian context uh, and you uh, bring it uh, outside its sort of uh, native uh, uh, environment, uh, you really sort of start thinking about uh, what it is actually you've done so far and, and how does it apply to completely new uh, environments, completely new cultures, completely new uh, contexts. Also like straddling on either side of, of the Atlantic somehow also has forced um, like a, an, another stage of almost like autonomy uh, of, uh, of people operating within the office and which again necessitates a certain form of empowerment that everybody actually uh, gets not only the, res the responsibility and, uh, uh, and all the hurt when things go bad, but, uh, but also the, 
the, the tools and the means to actually uh, do something that is genuinely uh, big. Uh, and, uh, and in that sense, I think it's been uh, almost like a mental exercise for ourselves to try to constantly reiterate and formulate and specify uh, what it is that, uh, that we've been doing so far and, and, and where it's going. So almost like I, I try to handpick a few of the things we've done, uh, go over it quickly and, and try to see where it maybe uh, points. Um, the first thing we did when we came to town was that we uh, declared our love to this uh, great city. Uh, that uh, have, have also joined uh, our team. But essentially, like, even though architecture is very slow, once in a while you actually get to realize something. So uh, we almost had like, this instant uh, construction site on, uh, on Times Square. Um, but um, I think what we tried to do is essentially try to sum up a little bit what it, what it was that we've been sort of doing for the last 10 years and how it could apply to an American context. So. Um, so basically, one of, one of the sort of main ideas we've been pursuing maybe over the last 10 years is this idea of creating cities and buildings like man-made ecosystems where we channel not only the flow of people but also the, the flow of resources through, uh, uh, through our uh, man-made environments. Um, another idea that so somehow was maybe inspired by the atmosphere on this photo, uh, it, it was taken by uh, uh, a photographer at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Copenhagen uh, and as you can see on the faces of, uh, I think especially Sarkozy, uh, <laughs> Merkel, but uh, also Obama, uh, it wasn't exactly a celebration, it was a complete failure. Uh, all of the goals that were established uh, were missed. Uh, and the general sort of discussion about sustainability was sort of drowning in this misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our current quality of life we are prepared to sacrifice in order to be sustainable. So we tried to say, what, what, if, what if we could sort of... Uh, and so you come with another angle on sustainability. What if sustainable cities actually increase our quality of life? And our first sort of architectural manifestation of this idea was the Danish pavilion in Shanghai, where we sort of took the elements from Copenhagen that make the city more enjoyable, like the blue bicycle lanes and the city bikes that allow you to sort of breeze through the city on a bike rather than sitting in a traffic jam or looking for a parking spot. Also inventing the ultimate museum for impatient people uh, you can do the whole thing in two minutes without missing uh, anything. Um, and also, uh, we created the Copenhagen Harbor Bath in Copenhagen, and we recreated the experience that you could actually jump in in China and feel how clean, if not how cold, uh, Danish harbor water is. Um, so essentially, this sort of consolidation of elements that what makes Copenhagen sustainable also makes it more enjoyable, that the two things can actually coincide. As a last way of attracting a little bit of attention, although uh, we don't like it, uh, sometimes you, uh, you have to capture the attention of, uh, uh, in this case, the Chinese. And we found like this uh, common denominator that all of the Chinese grew up with the story of the Little Mermaid, the national symbol of Denmark. So we, uh, we kidnapped her uh, for six months, uh, got her out of Copenhagen, got her through the Chinese customs and, <laughs> and, and into, the, into the pavilion. So, and, and this idea of trying to sort of find co um, ways that the life quality and sustainability can coincide, we've been pursuing in various ways. We did the mountain in Copenhagen that creates a man-made mountains of houses with garden that are sort of uh, sun-facing with daylight and views and gardens, uh, sitting on top of a, of a big uh, parking structure. A single funicular elevator gives access to, to all the apartments, so it becomes this sort of synergy. We call this idea architectural alchemy, that you can create uh, gold, or at least added value, um, by mixing uh, traditional ingredients. And this idea, we took it one step further uh, with this project called the Eight House uh, at the city limits of Copenhagen. This lake is where the city ends, uh, like literally where the city ends, and uh, uh, other life forms take over. Uh, and essentially what we did is that we mixed uh, shops and offices with townhouses, apartments, and, uh, and more uh, townhouses. Uh, we optimized for uh, uh, sunlight access and views, uh, arriving at this like twisted uh, figure eight uh, that doesn't only allow us to sort of optimize uh, the individual conditions for, uh, for the different programs, like the, uh, the townhouses with the little gardens in front are actually lifted up into the, into the sunlight uh, and the view. Uh, but it also allows for, in, in the middle of this new neighborhood, as you could see on the images, it's a, it's a new town. It's a city that's being built from scratch. 
you know, there is no existing uh, enjoyable little square or like a charming grocery on the corner. Um, so for a project like this to uh, acquire any success, it needs to somehow create its own environment. It has to uh, um, stimulate as much interaction as possible between the different uh, new inhabitants. Um, so in this way, the 8th uh, the house is not just like some uh, beautiful facade composition or like a sculptural object. It's a three-dimensional urban condition that expands public life uh, from the streetscape and up into the three-dimensional space of the urban block uh, and as such has actually sort of uh, really sort of accelerated the, the sort of um, degree of social interaction. Uh, the project is called the 8th House. The, the local inhabitants have now made a, a, a local magazine that they make that's called The Octopus and on the, on the back side it has a, a reoccurring uh, uh, comic strip called the, the Mobius strip. Um, so like in, in, in many ways I think uh, by inviting public life into the three-dimensional space of the block, it has also sort of accelerated this occurrence of a, or the creation of a, of a neighborhood. Um, also, all of the amenities uh, in the project are located where the eight uh, intersects itself. It's this bouncing uh, stair that uh, takes people all the way from the ground to uh, a shared roof terrace. And also it becomes this sort of man-made extension to the otherwise completely flat landscape of a uh, uh, of Copenhagen. So, um, so how can you take ideas like this to a completely new uh, uh, place? One of the first uh, cities we encountered uh, coming to North America was uh, Vancouver. Uh, it was also nicknamed Hongkouver uh, because of the massive amount of uh, first Hong Kong and then uh, Chinese uh, immigration. Uh, right here where the Granville Bridge hits downtown uh, and uh, turns into a trifork and starts shredding uh, our client's piece of land uh, into triangles. Uh, we were asked to look at, the, at making this sort of a, a new interpretation of this sort of Vancouverism model of uh, urban podium and, uh, and skinny towers. Um, as it's a quite tortured site, we started mapping all the constraints, the setbacks from the streets, the setback from the, from the highway. There's another 100 foot setback that the city wants to secure that nobody lives and looks straight out at heavy traffic. Finally, there's a park where they don't want shadows, and we're left with this sort of uh, tiny 6,000 square foot floor plate, um, which is even for Vancouver uh, prohibitively small. So then we were thinking, if the 100 foot setback has to do with creating a minimum distance, as soon as we get 100 feet up in the air, we can actually come back out, uh, create a 12,000 square foot uh, floor plate, maximize the amount of the nicest apartments, the one that had the most uh, daylight and views. So when you drive over the bridge, it becomes like almost somebody drawing a curtain aside, sort of a welcome to Vancouver. So it's almost like taking the idea of the flat iron. The flat iron was this moment in New York uh, history where real estate value, steel structure, and elevators made a previously ridiculous site uh, developable. Uh, although we are sort of taking it one step further, so we've been playing with the nickname uh, the fat iron. Uh, the client hasn't uh, adopted it. Uh, and, and actually beneath uh, the levels of, uh, of the highway uh, infrastructure, we have sort of nested in this little village of uh, uh, like shops and cafes and restaurants that creates almost like an under the high line kind of uh, element. And if you've ever been to Vancouver, you know that uh, having a canopy above the street can be a, uh, it's all like an urban umbrella. Um, so essentially, this, uh, this has been sort of a, one of our first takes on a, on a sort of uniquely, uh, in this case, Vancouverism uh, uh, sort of uh, urban development. Essentially applying this sort of Scandinavian thinking to a completely different uh, uh, environment. Um, a, a very recent project we've done is uh, in a completely different category. I couldn't really figure out where to stick it in into the lecture, so uh, here it goes. Um, Right south of Vancouver, you have Seattle, uh, which, uh, where like the main landmark, almost the Eiffel Tower of Seattle, is uh, the Space Needle from the World's Fair in the 60s. Um, and we were recently asked uh, by a client who'd been studying this uh, and looking into uh, adding it to another uh, great American city uh, that uh, is in the look uh, or like in the search of, a, of an architectural identity or. Or some, something that could be like the, uh, the signifier for the city. Uh, 
So essentially, uh, the, the, the raw ambition is to do for Phoenix what the Eiffel Tower is uh, for Paris. Uh, so a pretty, a pretty open brief. Um, so um, uh, we started looking into like different, like, like sort of doing another Space Needle, uh, like 50 years after the Space Needle, seems almost anachronistic. Uh, so we tried to th see if there was like a way that we could sort of uh, uh, come up with a sort of a genuinely sort of a, um, American experience. Like one of one of our favorite uh, works of uh, American architecture is, of course, the Guggenheim. This sort of incredibly dynamic experience where you rise to the top and then you descend, aided by gravity, uh, rotating around this central void. Uh, and our proposition was simply to turn uh, the Guggenheim inside out uh, and create this sort of experience where all of the different programs, uh, an observation deck, bar, exhibition spaces, uh, a shop, and a restaurant, could be organized into this sort of uh, continuous uh, spiraling descent. Uh, we have a tiny footprint. It's almost like dropping a big pin on Google Maps. Uh, and then essentially uh, a ramp takes you underground, an elevator takes you to the top, and then you have this sort of spiraling descent as you sort of contemplate the, the surrounding uh, panorama. And that's almost it. It's like what happens when you uh, marry a spiral to a globe? One of the things that happens is that uh, when you start on the North Pole, the circumference gradually gets bigger, so the floor plates get bigger towards the middle, and then they get small again towards the South Pole. So you get this sort of uh, almost like a cigar of continuous program. Also, as, as the program changes over time, like some programs perform better than others, we can actually completely flexibly uh, adapt. Uh, and you get this sort of, uh, uh, like the drama of descending underground, taking the elevator up, uh, penetrating the globe from beneath, uh, arriving at the North Pole, where you have like this generous uh, roof terrace. Uh, as you sort of descend uh, down, uh, you get the, the panorama. The floors are completely cantilevering, so there are no columns uh, blocking the view. And uh, the, the, cantilevering, uh, the cantilever is made possible by making them so thick towards the base that they actually become a space where we integrate all of the service spaces, like uh, um, restrooms, uh, uh, storage, kitchens. And that leaves the entire panorama completely uninterrupted. And you get this sort of dynamic uh, intersection between the horizon of the building that continually slopes down and the horizon of Phoenix that remains uh, horizontal on the sky. Uh, exhibitions, uh, uh, restaurants. This sort of E.T. E moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, like, and passively, we try to make it as like, reasonable for the climate. Uh, the globe is, of course, as compact as possible. The self-shading of the consistent cantilever, uh, the thermal exposure of the concrete structure on both floor and, and ceiling maximizes the, uh, the, the thermal mass that sort of keeps it as cool as possible. Also, the insane uh, ceiling heights, 20 floor, uh, foot ceilings, actually allows for uh, creating a comfort zone at the bottom, but actually allowing for higher temperatures uh, above uh, people's heads. Uh, all of these things, of course, make the building perform passively. But as the last element, we're looking at um, creating a collaboration with the local uh, convention center to install uh, 36,000 square feet of uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof, but maybe position them in a way that could create uh, some kind of an artwork. This is the Phoenix flag. Um, and, and of course, like sometimes it's silly to do artworks uh, facing only Google Earth, but in this case, there'll be 700,000 people per year uh, looking down on uh, uh, on the piece. Um, also, of course, when you are creating a new sort of a landmark for a city, you have to sort of contemplate the nicknames that you might uh, become the victim of. And I think uh, Big Pin would be nice. Uh, and also uh, the Honey Wand uh, seems to be like a, a relatively harmless uh, uh, nickname for a, a structure like this. Um, so, um, it's like, as you can see, like in, in a lot of these projects, even when they're privately commissioned, uh, uh, like in Vancouver and also in, in Phoenix, we, we really try to sort of uh, involve uh, the public element, uh, something like the public experience, uh, even the public perception as much as possible in, uh, in our work. Um, we did a project for uh, the City Hall of Tallinn in Estonia, uh, where the main idea was to undo the dichotomy where you have the people outside and the politicians inside. So we 
hovered the entire city hall above this sort of continuous public domain that enters uh, into the building, becoming a public service marketplace, allowing people to sort of see the politicians at work. Um, we call it like a public village because it's like a, 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 a conglomerate of different departments that create a continuous floor plate, but with uh, openness and transparency. Uh, and finally, we put the, the city council inside the spire. This is the old city hall of Tallinn, and this is the, the new. They, they couldn't imagine a city hall without a spire. So we said, let's put the city council inside, and let's make the ceiling, the sloping ceiling, as a giant mirror. So when the politicians have to make difficult decisions about the, the city, they look up, and they get this sort of a perfect periscope overview of the city they're messing with. Um, as a side effect, uh, when the angry citizens of Tallinn uh, gather to demonstrate, <laughs> they get this sort of perfect bird's eye view of uh, uh, sleeping politicians uh, squibbling dirty deals uh, to each other. Um, so we call it the democratic periscope that combines political overview with public insight. And, and to our uh, extreme luck, uh, the city council liked it and, uh, and uh, we won the, uh, the project. Uh, in one case in Copenhagen, we took public participation beyond the uh, reason, almost. Uh, uh, it's uh, where our office is located in Copenhagen. It's the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. Some of you might remember that we had a cartoon crisis uh, in Denmark. Uh, a provincial newspaper made fun of the Prophet Muhammad in the name of uh, liberty of speech, pissing off uh, a billion Muslims, uh, including uh, these boys that live in, uh, in our neighborhood. Um, so when we got invited to look at making uh, a new mile-long urban space right next to our office, uh, it was very clear that this project had to be all about uh, a, becoming a vehicle for integration and creating a sense of ownership. Um, so we made it into uh, this like uh, plan of uh, um, like this is actually the, the red square uh, in, in Copenhagen. It's it's not a Photoshop collage. It's a photo taken by Iwan uh, recently. Um, so the, the red square, everything is red, uh, even the walls surrounding it. Uh, the black market, everything is, uh, is black. Uh, and finally, uh, the black market leads into the, the green park, where the pavements will also eventually become, uh, become green. Um, and as a way of inhabiting this space, rather than plastering it with Danish design, it would be weird if the Danes had made the only nice bench, and the only nice lamp, and the only nice trash bin. So we reached out to the local community asking people to nominate elements from their other home country uh, to create this sort of almost like a, a global best practice of urban furniture. Uh, and the main idea is that we don't eat Chinese food to be nice to the Chinese. It's because sometimes we crave noodles uh, and uh, we don't specify uh, a Moroccan fountain to be nice to the Moroccans, but because they have an incredible tradition for architectural water features. So now. We have this Moroccan fountain in, uh, in Copenhagen. We, we made a, a muscle beach that combines elements from Los Angeles, uh, 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 Thailand, China, this uh, outrageous Estonian swing. Uh, <laughs> we, we actually ran into a liability issue with the, with the swing. Uh, we have a slide from Ukraine. Uh, it's actually from Chernobyl, so we had to make a copy because the original is uh, radioactive. Um, <laughs> So we get like the, all these like uh, exotic elements. The, even the signage on the red square is a sign from the red square. Uh, also, the bus sign is in uh, Arabic, I guess. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but at least it's you can see it's a bus. Um, and even like it's it's Denmark, so bicycle parking is key. Uh, these guys are from Germany, uh, and when you look at the benches, it becomes like a social study. Uh, this like uh, Latino bench where you can, it's almost like a love seat where you look the person you're sitting next to in the eyes. Uh, from Belgium, the opposite, everybody is looking away from each other. Uh, so you get, you get these sort of uh, obvious uh, differences uh, uh, on, on, even on the, on, on the way people inhabit the uh, urban space and octopus from Japan, uh, uh, snow cannons from Sweden, bird cages from Holland. We found palm trees in China that naturally grow in uh, uh, our climate zone. So now we have real uh, uh, sort of almost native uh, palm trees in, uh, in Copenhagen. And, and finally, as one of the last reminders, um, when you're traveling that you're in a foreign culture, is actually the advertisement. Uh, so this is, of course, from America. Uh, there's a series of, uh, of, uh, of sculptural lamps 
colorful sculptural lamps that advertise stuff you can't buy in Denmark. Uh, my favorite is this one. It's, uh, uh, it's from a dentist in Qatar. Uh, and of course, on the red square, an accumulation of uh, former Soviet uh, memorabilia. So um, the, the, the project recently uh, opened and, uh, and has really sort of become like a, a incredibly well populated by, by all kinds of, uh, uh, of, of user groups. So, um, of course, like uh, the project like Superkeel, like this uh, park in Copenhagen, is very informed by this sort of notion of, uh, of national cultural identity. Uh, it's almost trying to amass everything to sort of create a, 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 a truthful contemporary portrait of, uh, of Copenhagen today or this uh, neighborhood. Another project that really deals with national identity is a project we did for the National Art Museum in Greenland. Uh, Greenland recently acquired autonomy from uh, the Danish uh, kingdom. And one of their first projects uh, is going to be to create a, a national art museum. Um, it's located right next to these uh, nice uh, functional buildings built by the Danes. Uh, social housing where they moved the fishermen into these uh, modern apartments that completely ignore the landscape uh, and, and anything else. Uh, and what we did was to propose to create the smallest possible, uh, it's a small art museum, to capture the smallest possible uh, piece of Greenlandic uh, territory. Uh, but rather than ignoring the topography, this perfect circle um, adapts to the topography, become almost like a melted ring that opens up the courtyard towards the, the view of the water. Um, sort of following this melted geometry, it, uh, it lifts up towards the sea, inviting people to enter you have this sort of mini Guggenheim uh, descent along a picture gallery that takes you to a, a circle of galleries with uh, natural light and artificial light. Uh, and I think one of the mo main ideas of the project is that as soon as you enter into the ring, uh, you get this sort of uh, uh, melted uh, frame that captures a piece of Greenlandic nature, the landscape, the, the, the icebergs in the winter, uh, the Greenlandic weather, the Greenlandic uh, uh, flora, and uh, the Greenlandic artworks but completely edits out anything uh, of the Danish heritage. So it's almost like the sort of the heritage of Nuuk revisited and creating this sort of a Greenlandic sanctuary in, a, in the middle of the city, completely dominated by uh, Danish functionalism. Um, also, Greenland is actually becoming a quite interesting uh, uh, piece of the global puzzle uh, for different reasons. Uh, like, so politically, it's part of Europe, but uh, continentally, it's actually part of North America. Uh, and, and if you sort of unfold it around the North Pole, you'll see that you have all of the main economies, uh, essentially Asia, uh, North America, and Europe, uh, surrounding uh, uh, Greenland uh, uh, in the middle. So even though Greenland is positioned incredibly close to, uh, to everything, uh, the airport only has uh, an international uh, connection to, uh, uh, to Copenhagen. Um, it's actually one of the most remote uh, airports uh, 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 in the world. And when you look at the Air Greenland, uh, all, all of the passengers go to Kangalusuak, which is uh, a former American airstrip uh, with uh, no inhabitants. And from there, 100% of the passengers go on another flight somewhere else. Uh, most of them go to Nuuk, the, the capital of, uh, uh, of Greenland. Um, this means that, like, it's a, it's a dead end, uh, so the, all of the, the flights are only uh, a third full. So that makes uh, air travel to and from Greenland incredibly expensive. Uh, and for a country that's completely dependent on, uh, on air traffic as its infrastructure, it's totally crippled by this very expensive uh, air traffic. So we tried looking at Iceland. Iceland air has become a stopover between uh, Europe and North America. So of the two million passengers, uh, almost half, are actually in transit, and even as a bonus, uh, a tenth of them actually stay over, uh, which has actually boosted the tourism going to Iceland uh, quite significantly. So we're proposing to create a new airport in Nuuk to sort of uh, make Nuuk a natural stopover between Europe and, uh, and America. Um, another element that makes Greenland interesting is that if you look at Greenland vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North Pole, as the, north, uh, as the ice cap of the North Pole is melting, uh, the Northwest Passage above Alaska and Canada is, uh, is gradually opening up, which is going to free a shortcut between Asia and Europe, uh, 
uh, and even uh, uh, the east coast of, uh, of North America, uh, cu cutting a shortcut of 4,000 kilometers. Uh, also, when you look at the alternatives, the Suez Canal and uh, the Panama Canal, the Panama Canal is incredibly expensive and the Suez Canal is uh, incredibly dangerous because of pirates. Uh, so unless the Greenlanders take up piracy, it could actually be a very uh, competitive alternative. Uh, also, the amount of uh, cruise ship traffic is, uh, has doubled over the last 10 years and, and is making Nuuk and Greenland a, a very desirable destination. Finally, with the melting uh, ice, uh, oil has been uh, discovered on major areas uh, off the coast of Greenland, making it one of the top 10 oil reserves uh, on the planet. Uh, uh, and finally, um, other, other minerals like rare earth metals, Greenland actually has the largest reservoir uh, on the planet. So um, for like shipping out goods, Greenland is like soon going to be right on the sort of global superhighway of goods traffic and it's also going to be one of the main sources of, uh, of resources in, uh, in the world. So in this intersection between uh, our proposed uh, uh, plane route and, uh, and the cargo traffic, we propose to create this sort of uh, combined uh, uh, airport and seaport. Um, so as, as a simple idea, uh, on uh, the most uh, plain island we could find uh, off the coast of uh, Nuuk, uh, we sort of lay down a, a port, which is like a combination of cruise terminal and, uh, uh, and industry. Uh, the airport becomes like a bridge that spans between the two summits uh, of, the, of the rocky island, creating an airport terminal underneath the, the airstrip. Uh, it also becomes like a transit hub between uh, goods traffic and, and airport. Um, and the airport terminal also becomes a, a cruise ship terminal uh, for the cruise traffic. So this like very basic uh, layout of, of two sort of uh, intersecting a north-south axis for water and a east-west axis for, for air traffic. So essentially we, we did this, uh, this project uh, trying to sort of sum up a series of reports uh, that we had access to that have been done trying to sort of uh, harness one of the, I think one of the potentials that architecture has is that architects have the capacity to take complex information and distill it into concrete visions um, that sort of uh, become tangible, like we, we have the capacity to make things that are otherwise complex and, uh, and confusing into very tangible and debatable uh, uh, ideas. Um, almost like this sort of super studio uh, airport terminal spanning between uh, uh, the, the rocky cliffs of, uh, of Greenland. Uh, and the project is, uh, has been put forward and is now being sort of debated by uh, uh, the different municipalities of, uh, of Greenland. Uh, it's, a, it's a country with 55,000 people, but that also, uh, it's still difficult to get 55,000 people to, uh, to agree. Uh, but at least they have like this sort of a uh, concrete vision for, uh, for how to maybe completely reposition Greenland in, uh, in the global flow of, uh, of both traffic of people and, uh, and resources. It's also on display at the, at the Venice Architecture Biennale right now in, uh, uh, in Venice. This sort of leads me to the last um, category of projects that we've sort of become interested in uh, recently. The sort of idea of the relationship between social and cultural programs and, uh, and infrastructure, um, it, it almost seems to be sort of almost like a law of nature that the infrastructure of, uh, uh, of our past gets reappropriated to become uh, the framework for our sort of uh, culture and, and leisure of the, of the present. Uh, one sort of iconic example is uh, uh, Park City in Utah, used to be a mining town. Uh, but as the mines, uh, the silver mines dried out, uh, the lifts that were used for dragging silver down the mount mountain were reversed and started dragging skiers uh, up the mountain. Uh, this big building, the, the Silver King, uh, was this like a, a mine lift that turned into a, a ski lift. It, uh, it burned down in the 80s and as the only sort of remainder of the sort of uh, mining heritage of the town, it's, uh, it's now gone. But essentially today, the plumes of smoke have become plumes of snow cannons. Uh, also, Park City is the home of the Sundance Film Festival. Um, and another example, the, uh, what used to be uh, the gas station in town has now become the Kimball Art Center, uh, this uh, uh, art museum in the middle of the city. 
Uh, it's right where Main Street and, and the new main arrival from Deer Valley Drive hits uh, town. And they wanted to expand, uh, turn the old uh, garage into a learning center and make a new uh, uh, um, uh, sort of building for exhibitions, two galleries and some uh, uh, shared facilities. We propose to put everything on a single footprint to not mess with the existing building. When you start messing with uh, existing structures, it's almost like opening a Pandora's box of, uh, of misery. So we, uh, we st stuck to the small footprint. The bottom gallery is nested into the landscape. The upper gallery is turned to face visitors coming to town, almost like a, a friendly building turning its head to greet people. Uh, welcome to, uh, to Park City. And miraculously, this new volume, even though it's significantly taller than uh, uh, the neighbor buildings, it's exactly the same silhouette as, uh, as the Silver King that, uh, that used to be there uh, 20 years ago. Also, like, the, the question is, like, how can you integrate some a, a sort of a contemporary architecture into sort of a, uh, a, a town full of, uh, of heritage? And we started looking at the, the immigrants that came to uh, 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 Utah were mostly Scandinavians. Uh, and they brought with them this sort of uh, technique of log cabin construction for the mining shafts and for their, uh, for their architecture. Uh, it's been refined uh, in present uh, Utah to these like really elegant uh, interlocking uh, corner joints of the silos. Uh, even the, the Navajo Indians use uh, uh, logs, massive logs, to create these like organic uh, uh, shapes. Um, and finally, the, um, the Great Pacific Railroad used to have a bridge uh, on piles running over the Salt Lake. And today they're actually extracting uh, the piles that have been marinating in salt for like decades. And it's something they call trestle wood, this very beautiful textured wood. Uh, so we simply propose to sort of combine all of these different elements and use the tectonics of uh, log cabin construction, use the thickness of the logs uh, and this sort of working with the solid wood that's actually both insulating and, uh, and structural. Uh, to create this sort of Kimball log uh, 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 idea. So essentially just using um, the fact that the, the massive logs have uh, uh, excessive depth, they can actually both be structural, insulating, and also accommodate the, uh, the complex geometry of, uh, uh, of the architecture. Uh, the Silver King used to have like this sort of steel skeleton inside a wooden frame, and that's exactly how the galleries uh, uh, sort of contained in their own climate and uh, framed by, uh, by this wooden box and all the circulation essentially follows the, uh, the wood. So as you enter in, you'll, you'll follow this sort of uh, heavily textured uh, envelope. You'll have the uh, this restaurant uh, sandwich between the, the two galleries. Uh, and as you sort of follow the light upwards, uh, you reach uh, this sort of panoramic view of, uh, uh, of the mountains and, uh, and the surrounding valley. So, um, so in a way, you can say that uh, the new Kimball becomes like a, a, a landmark or a beacon or a pivoting point of the cultural city, uh, Park City, in the same way that uh, uh, the Silver King was it for the industrial city. So in many ways, this sort of idea of, of social infrastructure, um, we've been sort of um, encountering in many cases uh, by sort of... Uh, 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 sort of um, reappropriating existing structures. We're doing a project in, uh, in, in Copenhagen right next to Shakespeare's uh, uh, Hamlet's uh, castle, Kronborg. Uh, Kronborg has become UNESCO World Heritage. And as a result, they had to kick out the Danish Maritime Museum, which was inside the, mu uh, the, the castle. And they proposed to put it inside this uh, decommissioned dry dock, uh, proposing to empty it of water and, and stuff the museum into it. Uh, uh, of course, the dry dock is, is obvious because it's where they used to build ships. But the museum program was twice the size of the dock itself. So we would almost like drown the entire uh, dock in museum program. So we thought it would be much greater to actually keep it as a, as a big, generous void, 25 meters across, uh, 500 feet uh, in length. Um, also, we started reading the technical reports that uh, the pressure from the surrounding soil and water would cause uh, the walls to collapse unless we would reinforce it from the inside or from the outside. So we thought, if we're going to like make new uh, foundation walls anyway, why don't we actually leave enough space to accommodate the museum between the new and the old dark walls? Almost like turning the museum brief inside out. Um, imagine like this uh, big void. 
Uh, it also became sort of a, a way to address the dilemma that uh, UNESCO said that we had to be completely invisible and to not block the view of ha Hamlet's castle. But of course, the museum sponsors wanted some kind of architectural landmark uh, that would uh, draw people into the, into the museum. And by making it a void, we could actually sort of combine the two, uh, the two elements. You would sort of descend uh, on the roof of these bridges into the museum. Inside the bridges, they would have programs. And also, the bridges would help uh, bring daylight into this otherwise completely underground uh, uh, museum. Um, actually, when, when we did the competition, uh, we thought that it was going to be very difficult to, uh, uh, to win, because it was uh, like the brief said that you had to build inside the dock and we were building outside. Um, and also, our, our union, the Danish uh, Architects Association, actually sued the client for having chosen a winner that broke one of the conditions of the brief, uh, which uh, made us uh, carefully reconsider our membership of the Danish uh, Architects Association. Um, but happily, the client uh, had gotten so convinced about the idea that they said, okay, we cancel the competition and we hire big as our architects. Um, so uh, we've been working on this uh, surreal project since uh, 2007. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, all the way from China, because uh, we are right in the port. We could actually order the steel bridges uh, in a Chinese shipyard and sail it on a container ship. Uh, and uh, a few days ago, they, they arrived and they started uh, dumping them in. So this is like this little tour where you descend on the roof of the bridges. You look into uh, these like uh, interlocking spaces. Like almost anything in the in the museum is uh, is interlocking and. Uh, and the project is, uh, is opening in, uh, in June uh, uh, next year. Also, like, paradoxically, almost all the work we're doing in Denmark uh, is underground for some reason. Uh, uh, we recently dug up my entire high school courtyard uh, because uh, some, uh, it, like, it gives you incredible satisfaction to really mess uh, that massively with your old uh, high school. Um, but actually, I got a, a phone call from my old, old math teacher um, to look into doing a sports hall somewhere in, uh, in the school. And uh, we got the idea of putting it actually under the courtyard uh, as this like a uh, mole mount uh, uh, in the middle of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the existing school. Um, the way it's done is that uh, it's a handball hall and there are some requirements. You need 15 feet of clearance towards the edges and 25 feet in the middle. Um, so almost like a, as an homage to my old math teacher, uh, we used the formula for gravity's rainbow, uh, the curve of a thrown uh, object, uh, to uh, sort of shape uh, the roof structure of the, uh, of the sports hall. Uh, so that is essentially what this is. It's my high school education money coming into good use. Uh, and of course beneath you get this uh, almost like algebraic uh, uh, expression of, uh, uh, of math applied to uh, underground uh, handball hall. Which is also like an incredible reminder, like uh, most of our projects died in uh, September 2008 with the global financial crisis, including the project we had done for uh, the National Bank of Iceland, which suddenly wasn't uh, super urgent anymore. Uh, so uh, like, uh, in August, we had two uh, topping ceremonies, and it's such an amazing reminder of how, uh, how all the stuff we do actually once in a while leads to uh, build work, and uh, like the pure physical pleasure of touching uh, cast concrete and wooden beams is, uh, is something uh, uh, I hope uh, all of you get to experience uh, uh, as much as possible. Um, also, like this, this idea of going underground uh, in Denmark uh, seems to be the only way we can build in, uh, in Denmark. Um, another example of like revisited infrastructure, in this case, uh, infrastructure for war. Uh, we got invited to do a, a project uh, on the west coast of, uh, um, of Denmark, which was part of the Atlantic defense wall that the Germans built against the Allies. Uh, it's in the middle of this dune landscape, and just to sort of see the scale of, uh, of war, like they actually built an entire train line that went all the way into the dunes uh, so that they could arrive with this uh, huge cannon uh, that had been manufactured in Germany, sailed to, uh, uh, to Denmark and then driven into the dunes on this uh, purposely built uh, rail tracks. 
It was scheduled for being installed in uh, September 1945, and for good reasons, uh, uh, it never happened. Uh, so only the, the concrete uh, remains. Uh, and we were asked to do uh, four museums in the dunes uh, right around the, uh, the old bunker. Uh, and it's going to be a museum of bunkers, a museum of local history, a museum of amber, and, a, and an art museum. So essentially our, our main proposition, since we're in this like, uh, heritage landscape of the dunes right next to the bunker, was to consider the museum and, and a negative bunker, if you like, uh, a void next to the uh, existing block. So essentially we, uh, we positioned the four uh, galleries so they are nested into the, into the, into the dunes. So uh, it becomes like this sort of uh, perfectly invisible uh, intervention. You won't even see that, the, that something has happened. As you sort of arrive, you only see the, uh, the bunker. Uh, and then gradually you discover these like uh, um, discrete incisions into the, into the dunes. You arrive at this like uh, central plaza where you can descend uh, into the, the four different museums. Even though they are completely underground, they're also washed in, uh, in daylight. And then uh, the bunker museum leads towards uh, the existing uh, bunker, where we've proposed this one intervention. We keep the spaces as they are, but this spiraling stair takes you up to the center uh, of, uh, of this skylight, which is, in fact, uh, we studied the drawings uh, of the cannon. Um, and we thought that rather than doming it off with some kind of a silly uh, uh, piece of architecture to create this almost like an x-ray of the cannon, like a wireframe of steel and, uh, and glass. Uh, so you go up into the middle of it. Uh, by arriving at the middle, we can also ensure that it can actually turn. Uh, and up there, uh, we transform the cannons into uh, binoculars uh, that actually uh, amplify your view uh, so you can see 55 kilometers, which actually happen to be the range of the, of the cannons. So uh, just by going up there and sort of moving around, you'll be able to intuitively understand that this place in the middle of the Danish dunes was actually a very strategic point uh, in the sort of uh, in the battle of, uh, uh, of Europe. Um, so it almost becomes like this sort of a, uh, almost like a little art piece that's sort of, or a ghost of, a, of the gun that was never, uh, never installed. I think finally the last, uh, two projects uh, I'd like to show, try to sort of work more uh, proactively or forward-looking, like instead of reinventing or reinterpreting existing pieces of infrastructure to actually start using uh, infrastructure uh, together with uh, cultural or social programs, uh, uh, um, sort of trying to explore some kind of a new, uh, uh, new hybrid. One is like a very small piece. We got asked to do a, a private art museum for a collector in uh, in Scandinavia that has like a sculptural park in this beautiful landscape. Um, he has an existing uh, sculpture park uh, and he has just made a, a big new land purchase. So uh, um, that would essentially create like a, a kind of confused circulation in his uh, park. And we proposed that the art museum itself, which is only like a, a 20,000 square foot building, could become a bridge, um, bridging across the, the river creating a continuous loop through the, the different sculptures. And essentially you have a slope on one side and a horizontal uh, landscape on the other side. So to mitigate the difference in topography, uh, this um, museum uh, uh, makes a 90 degree turn. Also having a, a big project room with side light, skylit galleries, uh, media galleries and painting galleries. And like this sort of very specific uh, space in the middle uh, joining the, the different galleries. A single window, a single skylight, turns into a panoramic view. And as you sort of enter into the, into the bridge, you arrive from the flat side, you have this sort of stack of galleries uh, above each other. Uh, you move up to where the building makes a, a 90 degree turn and the twist creates this fanning staircase that joins all of the different uh, galleries. You have this amazing uh, skylight that sort of uh, flips down and becomes a panoramic view of the existing uh, mill that's sitting uh, uh, on the river. And you can sort of continue through the, the sculpture park. So in a way it becomes a hybrid between a building, a bridge and a, and a sculpture. You can almost see the museum as one of the bigger sculptures uh, in this park that also c counts 
Oldenburgs and uh, Sarahs and uh, and uh, and Anish Kapoor's. Um, so depending on where you see it from, it really becomes like this sort of almost enigmatic object uh, uh, in its own right. So that leads me to uh, like one project we've done in Copenhagen that I think somehow sums up all of the different elements that we've been working with over the last uh, decade. Uh, we got invited by uh, the 10 municipalities of uh, Metropolitan Copenhagen to look at making uh, a master plan uh, uh, for the 10 municipalities, trying to look uh, a few decades into the future uh, and looking at how uh, this sort of urban periphery could be tied together with uh, a new train line. And we thought, if we want to talk about the, city, the, the future of Copenhagen, we can't just look at Copenhagen or we can't just look at the, the outskirts. We also have to look uh, at the Swedish side, like right on the other side of this bridge, we have uh, Sweden and uh, another 10 municipalities that have almost the same uh, demographic and economy as, uh, as, as our client. It's essentially the most dense and most economically prosperous part of, uh, of Scandinavia. And just by adding a three mile bridge, we can create a single metropolitan loop where no area is going to be further away than 40 minutes by public transportation. It also consolidates all of the best businesses in, uh, in Scandinavia into a, a single region. And by merging it and creating a binational master plan, we introduce pink in a Scandinavian flag uh, for the first time. It's also the same size as the San Francisco Bay Area. So as an urban entity, it's a kind of known uh, quantity. And the main proposition is to not just make an infrastructure for trains, but also a smart grid that combines uh, hydroelectricity of Sweden with wind power of Denmark, uh, like waste management, uh, resource management, and so to basically integrate uh, the different public investments in infrastructure with uh, uh, in, uh, sort of developments for uh, commerce, residential, uh, education, and, uh, uh, and industry. Um, and the first sort of built example of, of this sort of extreme hybrid uh, of sort of infrastructural and social programs is going to be a project uh, we did for uh, a waste to energy power plant in the middle of, uh, of Copenhagen. Essentially, 97% um, uh, of uh, the people in Copenhagen get their heating as district heating, that is excess heat from the power production. So essentially the main idea is that you throw out uh, your trash, six pounds of trash, turns into four hours of electricity and five hours of heating. If you look at it as a resource, a ton of trash is almost the same as two barrels of oil. Um, but of course, and it has to be in the middle of the city because it's part of the, uh, the district heating grid uh, and also to minimize transportation of, of waste. So um, these things are like big ugly boxes uh, that cast shadows on the neighbors and block the view. It's also going to be the tallest uh, structure in, in Copenhagen and the biggest. Um, it's right next to the Copenhagen Marina and right next to where these boys go water skiing. Um, so speaking of skiing, Danes love to ski. Um, we have absolutely no mountains. Uh, we have snow. We have no mountains. But we do have mountains of trash. Um, so our basic proposition is that people happily go six hours by bus to Isabel in the south of Sweden. Um, because of the sheer magnitude of the power plant, we can do something two-thirds the, the size uh, on the roof of our power plant. We know how big the machinery is, so we wrap it with a continuous envelope. Uh, and instead of making a visitor center where school teachers can drag the children to force them to listen to how trash turns into energy and heating, uh, we install an elevator that takes you to a, a green, a blue, and a black ski slope. Um, Miraculously, we won uh, the competition based on this idea. Uh, so from uh, 2016, you're going to have to look out for the Danish competitors in alpine skiing, because now we can actually practice at home. Um, also, the facade uh, is made as, the, as these giant planters, uh, prefabricated elements uh, um, that filter daylight into the naturally ventilated uh, workspaces. So you can say, in many ways, this sort of idea that I, I started with of trying to consider cities and buildings as man-made ecosystems is very close to completion in this case where not only do we harvest locally available resources like daylight, chimney effect of natural ventilation, the water accumulated on the roof, but also together with the city, uh, the waste turning into heat and electricity, 
the project creates a, a giant man-made uh, ecosystem. This is gonna be the cleanest waste to energy power plant uh, on the planet. Uh, the smoke coming out of the chimney is completely non-toxic, but it still contains a certain amount of CO2. Um, so together with Rally to United from Berlin, we, b we developed this idea uh, that uh, the chimney accumulates uh, CO2, and when there's uh, 200 kilos, uh, this piston uh, compresses and puffs uh, a gigantic uh, smoke ring. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, of course, on, uh, on one hand, uh, we think it's kind of the most literal possible interpretation of the idea of hedonistic sustainability, that something that used to be a symbol of a problem turns into something playful that puffs smoke rings. Uh, but also, more importantly, um, I think for, for anything in, in architecture or anything in life, uh, understanding precedes action that if people don't know, they can't act. And one of the difficult things about uh, uh, CO2 emissions is that nobody knows what it is. It's like this uncountable, abstract tail of smoke. Uh, nobody knows what a ton of CO2 is. Uh, in 2016, all you have to do is count the smoke rings. And when you counted five of them, uh, we just emitted uh, one ton of CO2. Uh, so I think almost like as an, as an art piece, it really manifests one of, one of the main sort of potentials of architecture is that we have the capacity to access uh, complex amounts of information and distill it into concrete, tangible visions uh, that actually make the complex uh, uh, available for, uh, for discussion and, uh, and action. Um, and actually, as, almost as a side effect, shortly after doing the power plant, uh, we won a competition to do a ski resort in Lapland in Finland where we took the idea back to the slopes, so the, the hotel is made, so you can take the elevator up from the lobby to the roof, uh, and then uh, the roof of the hotel is actually the, the first part of, uh, of the ski slope. So first we stole the idea from the mountains and then, uh, and then brought it back. Actually, as, as the last sort of a proof that this also works in New York City, um, the reason that we came here uh, two years ago to open our office was that uh, the Durst organization, that actually when I was teaching at Columbia, uh, like academia can lead to the most uh, interesting things. I was teaching here three years ago, and, and one of our sites was a Durst-owned uh, plot of land on 42nd Street, and we invited the uh, people from Durst to review the students. Um, and I, I guess I have to thank uh, my students at the time because like, they didn't scare off uh, Durst and made Durst come back uh, for more. Uh, uh, namely, this site on uh, West 57th Street, uh, which even though it's beautifully located on the waterfront, is, is sandwiched between a power plant and a waste management facility, not combined, uh, and then a, a highway. So our main suggestion was to almost like create a sense of place and in a way like the Copenhagen Courtyard, this is where my dad grew up. Uh, the Copenhagen Courtyard is almost at the architectural scale what Central Park is at an urban scale, like a green oasis in the middle of the dense city. So the question became like, what happens when skyscraper meets courtyard, or what would a, a court scraper look like? Um, that's basically it, we placed the courtyard next to the Helena. Um, we try to preserve all of her views because she's owned by our client. Uh, and then we raised the northeast corner to 470 feet, creating Manhattan density, while still uh, preserving daylight access, sunshine, and views uh, from the entire courtyard. And as a result, we create this sort of rather striking new silhouette on, uh, on the west side, uh, this sort of hybrid between a, a courtyard and a skyscraper. From the east, it looks more like a spire, uh, when you sort of... Uh, enter into the lobbies, uh, the sort of a uh, grand stair takes you up into the, the courtyard that leads you uh, towards this, uh, um, almost like the bottom of the valley, you actually have 42 inches, and in the other corner you have 400 feet, uh, so this sort of extreme uh, asymmetry. Uh, all of the tenants looking uh, towards the, the roof have uh, little uh, terraces sunken into the, into the roofscape. Um, 
and they all have views over the Hudson and, uh, and the Hudson River Park. So as, a, as an architectural idea, it's almost like continuing the transformation that New York has gone through by transforming its former uh, industrial waterfront into parks or the High Line into a, a, a sort of an urban promenade. Uh, and this idea of rejuvenation is actually starting to invade uh, the courtyard uh, uh, itself. Um, we broke ground on this thing uh, two months ago. It's currently uh, a hole in Manhattan the size of two soccer fields. Um, and in, uh, with a little bit of luck, in three and a half years, this could be the view going up and down the west side the uh, highway. Thanks. So, for those of you who have energy, uh, yeah, the first So, uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, the second one, the, since your, uh, somehow your, your projects are quite mathematically uh, easy to be described. <laughs> uh, so, is there any, uh, do you think of any way to establish a library to uh, quantify all these ideas and, uh, and to uh, uh, to uh, make some uh, uh, use some computational uh, method to uh, make uh, uh, help help designers not to uh, uh, to 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 use all of these good ideas instead of uh, uh, forgot some of them. Uh, that's my question. I think it's on. Is it not? No, now it's on. Um, so, um, the, the question was if uh, we can make a plugin for Grasshopper uh, that can automate uh, uh, the way we design. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, no, like, I, I think, uh, I, I think, I think uh, we are as interested in, uh, in parametric design as anyone else. I think the, it's all, a, I think where parametric design sometimes uh, uh, fails is that the, the most important thing is not how, which things you can automate uh, with a grasshopper script, but rather what are the parameters that you select uh, and what are the consequences you address those parameters with. So I think in the end, the, um, um, I mean, I think what we're very interested in in architecture is actually to develop or evolve new typologies. And I, I think almost like the definition of a typology is some kind of a idea or an, an element of, of innovation that is uh, regardless of the talent or the specific expression of the person or the team um, materializing it. So uh, you can actually take the same typology or the same idea and you can do it in a way that looks completely different uh, with different sensibilities and a different expression, but it will still somehow contain the, um, uh, almost like the, 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 the attributes of that specific typology. And in that sense, I think we, uh, as, a, as an office, as a practice, really hope to uh, 
uh, invent typologies that will be picked up by, uh, by our colleagues. Because the, the interesting thing is, like, uh, I think Oscar Niemeyer is probably one of the most uh, prolific uh, architects. He's built more than anyone, and uh, he keeps on living, so he will build more than anyone has ever built. Uh, but still, it's maybe like 100 buildings, or maybe 200, or I don't know. Uh, so if you want to sort of contribute uh, to, to something that could have a massive positive impact on the future uh, uh, of uh, our planet and of human life, uh, it's, it's the ideas that you can put out there that actually can be taken up and pursued uh, autonomously of your own... Uh, uh, practice uh, by your colleagues and in that sense I think the whole discourse of architecture is interesting because it becomes like a global conversation uh, like in the same way that we stole a lot of ideas from uh, from street furniture from all across these 60 different countries on the planet and brought them to Copenhagen they'll probably be uh, misinterpreted in Copenhagen and they might actually send something uh, uh, send something back so um, so in that sense I think uh, like Le Corbusier when uh, when he died, uh, long before he died, he wrote uh, an essay uh, called Nothing is Transmissible But the Thought, which is this idea that it's maybe not so much what you actually built, because uh, like one day uh, all your buildings might, uh, might have turned into ruins, but it's the ideas that you, uh, that you pass on that can actually uh, spread like uh, rings in the water and have a much more massive impact. So in that sense, uh, I'm not sure if you can automate it, but I hope that uh, like each project, when it, when it works well and it stumbles upon something, it contains uh, a reproducible element of innovation that can be pursued uh, by another architect in another context and create uh, new and, uh, and interesting results. Uh, physical diversion or a mental diversion? Uh, the, the question was if big architecture is a physical or a mental diversion. Um, um, our, our next book is going to be uh, titled uh, Bigger Me. Uh, you can have both. Uh, because I, I, uh, I think and which is something that applies to maybe all other things than, uh, than romance, uh, although it has even been pursued by, even by architects. Uh, but um, I, I think quite often, uh, especially in academia, there's a desire to distill things into uh, diametric opposites. And I think almost as a law of nature, um, evolution or innovation often occurs when you actually take things that seem mutually exclusive and you combine them in, uh, uh, in, in, in radical new hybrids. Uh, I think even down to like, like of course like in, in da Darwinian evolution, it's a, it's a male and a female uh, with uh, opposing uh, uh, attributes and often tempers that uh, are attracted and have spin-off or offspring that combine their attributes. But also in architecture, I think the whole, the fundamental condition of the city is that you have a constricted space uh, that is occupied by many different people from many different cultures or age groups or languages or nationalities or professions. And we have to find, we, ha we have to constantly try to orchestrate ways of successfully accommodating this, uh, uh, this coexistence. Uh, so I think in that sense, um, uh, I think almost in any case, uh, any, any time you can say something, uh, the opposite is also, if not true, then at least uh, possible. And I think, I think it's, uh, it's the combination of something mental and, and physical, something emotional and intellectual, uh, where you have uh, uh, the, real, um, the real synergy or the real uh, uh, potential to move forward. efficient buildings are very critical of the modern architect's use of glass and its abundance, recognizing that other components of the building system have shorter life terms or becoming more 
energy efficient, but the facade has 50, 100 years, and it is sort of the, increasingly the weak, weak link in building performance. Can you talk about how you use glass, recognizing its pros and cons in this regard? Um, yeah, like, glass is very good for daylight. Uh, I, um, <laughs> no, but I think, um, I mean, I think glass has the advantage that uh, it's a lot easier to draw a curtain than it is to uh, punch a hole in a concrete wall. Um, I think it's, I mean, essentially, I think actually the, the studio that I taught here at Columbia was called uh, uh, Vernacular 2.0. And, uh, and, and we were trying to see if we could somehow revisit uh, Bernard Rudowski's ideas of vernacular architecture, this idea that uh, all across the planet people have found ways of using the locally available uh, materials and the locally available technologies uh, to uh, respond to the local climate in ways that would maximize uh, uh, life quality in the structures. And that has led to a lot of very radically different architectural expressions that are, as uh, Rudowski called it, architecture without architects, because they're like empirical uh, discoveries or traditions that make uh, architecture in Spain look very different from architecture in Scandinavia. And I think Bernard Rudowski's main interest was aesthetic, that he was tired of the fact that the international style of modernism had made all cities and buildings look the same. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is apply this thinking to, uh, what, to, um, to architecture. Uh, and our proposal was vernacular 2.0. Because you can say, like, essentially, the, the international style of modernism was a child of, among other things, the advent of the building engineer and building engineering and building services. And essentially, building services is, by definition, a mechanical compensation for the fact that the building performs badly at what it's built for. Uh, it represented a lot of freedoms. You could replace uh, uh, operable windows with uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. You could replace thermal insulation and solar orientation with central heating and air conditioning. You could pre replace uh, uh, daylight with artificial light. So it felt as freedoms, but in the end, the, the architecture was doing nothing. It was just like a dumb container. And then it had a basement full of gas guzzling machinery that was like pumping uh, quality into, uh, uh, into this uh, tube-fed patient. And, uh, and the proposition of the studio was that uh, once again, we have to find out that buildings have to look different in different environments, in different climates. Um, so we call it not architecture without architects, but engineering without engines, that, that you could use contemporary engineering, the capacity to model and simulate and calculate to uh, bring attribute back into the permanent design of the building, the orientation of the, of the structure, the uh, the use of materials, uh, the size of the cantilevers, the overhangs, the natural shade, uh, etc., so that the building would end up looking different because it was performing different. Uh, and I think you'll find that in some contexts, like for instance, like in Scandinavian context, uh, glass, especially glass applied to the right facades, can be very beneficial. Very beneficial because you can uh, harvest a lot of passive solar heat gain, and especially when the sun is coming at a low angle. Uh, uh, that's the time when you really would like to harvest uh, the potential for thermal uh, solar heat gain. And when the sun is higher on the sky, uh, you get more natural uh, uh, shade uh, from potential overhangs. So in that sense, it's always a question of calibrating uh, the architecture, including the use of glass, to, uh, to whatever context you're in. to build in New York, um, and it was exciting to see that you'd broken ground on uh, West 57th. Um, but maybe a dose of reality share with us, a couple of weeks ago, the community board rejected design, land use committees not happy with it. So what kind of strategies are you going to use to, to get to combat that, and do you expect that your building may be compromised in some way? I think, um, I mean, architecture is, of course, like insanely uh, complex to get anything to happen, uh, you have to sort of transmit your ideas uh, to um, <clears throat> an army of um, 
consultants and clients and, uh, and municipal politicians and, and uh, city planning department and, and, and neighbors, etc. And before you get to realize anything, you have to celebrate like a thousand victories and, uh, and a single defeat uh, and the project is dead. Uh, so I think what, 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 where we are now is that uh, uh, the city council loves the, the building. They even say that they would like to do uh, uh, almost like anything they can to make, the, to make sure that this project gets realized. But at the same time, they have this one moment where there's a rezoning, so they... Uh, and, and it is a kind of a hostage situation where, uh, like, before they, they give their uh, approval, they, they can try to demand as much as possible. The specific case is that uh, Durst has offered to do a 20% uh, affordable rental uh, in the project. Um, and uh, to go beyond the traditional 20 years, they have actually offered 35 years, but now the, the city council is demanding uh, infinite uh, uh, affordability. So um, it's somehow it's so beyond architecture that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a completely different uh, negotiation. And, and although we like to think of ourselves as omnipotent, uh, this is probably uh, like a little bit uh, outside our uh, sphere of influence. I'm still uh, relatively uh, optimistic because um, uh, at least the, the hole in the ground is getting bigger, so, 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 so some, somebody somewhere is, uh, is still optimistic. Uh, you must have a million things coming your way and possibilities. Can you walk us through your priorities right now? Like, what are you focusing on? What, what are the main things that you're, that you're thinking right now? Um, I mean, I think, um, I mean, of course, the last two years has been like an incredible adventure. Like, I think we started uh, 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 two years ago. Uh, I, I came here in September together with Beat, and then uh, uh, like a day later, Daniel Kidd uh, joined, and we were like, uh, like walking the streets looking for a, sp a space to be. Uh, and like now we are uh, with 55 people uh, uh, here in, uh, in New York. So I think like one of the main focuses has been uh, um, to get this whole uh, um, uh, American thing uh, uh, to, to happen. Uh, and uh, then I think secondly, I think the, the, the big learning curve for the office has been to, and, and I think in, in a way, I think sort of over your lifetime as an architect, uh, like just looking at it personally, in the beginning, I, I'm so old that I started doing uh, uh, crayon and rotring hardline drawings. Uh, and then you graduate to use uh, a mouse, uh, sort of a computer-aided software. And like back then when we like picked up the computer, a lot of people were like, eh. and like you lose uh, the sensitivity of the pen on the paper and blah, blah. But, uh, but of course, you acquire new tools, you acquire new levels of precision, you acquire uh, the capacity to, uh, to, to use like, more uh, complex processing power, etc. And gradually, you graduate to, using, uh, to collaborating with people. Like, essentially, I, I speak uh, way more than I, uh, uh, than I draw at this point. Uh, and you start finding ways of actually uh, collaborating successfully. And then, um, maybe in the beginning, I was always doing the book and the boards. Uh, uh, then I was always doing the text, uh, and like eventually I uh, uh, I do less and less. I'm sort of uh, planning my own retirement, uh, early retirement. No, but I, but I think it's because like I think I, uh, what we're doing, and, and and at the same time, sadly, I have to uh, uh, observe that in my own opinion, our work is actually getting stronger the the less I have to do with it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think it's because I think we are in this process of creating. Uh, uh, like a you know a, a, a culture in a way like because um, like uh, you can definitely observe that within the office. Also, like if you look at the partnership, uh, two years ago I announced uh, seven partners. Uh, half of them have actually been uh, my students. Um, uh, like the majority of our project leaders uh, have been interns in the office. So in that sense, we're also somehow educating the next generation uh, ourselves. Or a lot of it is homemade. Uh, we do uh, supply new genes into the gene pool. 
so it doesn't become some kind of an incestuous uh, 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 discourse. But um, so I, I think in that sense, I'm, I'm very interested in what it is that makes the work keep because like a lot of practices have suffered from a bottleneck condition that if you have a single creative genius uh, that acquires more work uh, and an army of executive morons uh, that uh, execute the genius sketches, eventually the, the bottleneck, uh, you know, the work gets diluted because uh, a single creative genius spread out on 150 people becomes very little genius left. And I think we... Uh, I think successfully looking for another model where um, I think we are actually uh, a lot more people today than we were uh, five or ten years ago, and still somehow the work keeps uh, on track, and uh, and I think we keep evol evolving the discourse. So so I think that has maybe been my main focus is straddling uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, how do we make sure that both, uh, both offices uh, keep growing? And, uh, and also, let's say, um, of the people that are now in, uh, in New York, um, maybe five or 10 of us have somehow uh, been part of a uh, big in Copenhagen, uh, and the other 50 are uh, coming from, from elsewhere. So how do you maintain uh, getting this like uh, relatively quickly accumulated uh, body of people to actually work uh, uh, um, as big or whatever. So, so I, I think that's really the the focus. Like in in that sense, even though I didn't start out with any fantasy to start an office, it was more like me and Julien had some some ideas we wanted to pursue, uh, and then you know. Doing it on our own became the logical way to do that, uh, and then eventually we, uh, we we decided to pursue them uh, uh, with other people in other setups. Uh, and but but I think gradually I've become more and more interested in considering the office itself a work of architecture, like the sort of people architecture or creative architecture. Uh, and I think that uh, I think we're still not there. But I, I think if we can if we can crack that uh, uh, that mystery, then maybe the uh, the grasshopper uh, uh, plug-in that you were uh, requesting uh, can, can be available. <laughs> so I will ask a question that probably just needs a yes or a no as an answer. Um, looking into Ai Weiwei's last documentary, there is this very nice moment at the beginning where he talks about his cats. He has like 30 cats in his courtyard, and he hates cats. But there is one of those cats that has actually learned um, how to open the door of the studio. Only one of the cats has learned. Which documentary was this? It's a last day we was documentary film. It's called, who has seen it, guys? But who is the person? A Wei Wei. Ah, Wei Wei, okay. Yes, sorry. So, um, from these 30 cats, right, one managed to open the door. It's an extremely learning process of intelligence that has a very pragmatic purpose. But he says what is fascinating about the cat is not only that he learns to open the door, is he doesn't learn to close it, right? And so my impression is that you are one of those cats that learns how to open the doors, but also to close it. Meaning that you become extremely pragmatic, extremely smart in adopting, taking everything that history has given us, uh, typologies, forms, materials, technology, engineering, to the point that is overly strange, easy, to find an individual that brings all those things. It's like a cat that opens a door and closes a door as well, right? So my question is, is this idea of extreme rigor and extreme pragmatism, of course with an amazing dose of optimism that is the one that you bring. My question is, is the one of, of the cat, right? We love cats because when they open the door and they leave, we have no idea where they are going. They have this mysterious way of just mesmerizing us with where the hell are they going is the madness of the cat, right? So my question, and this is why I say maybe it's a yes or a no, um, does VRK have any madness? Um. <laughs> no. Uh. I mean, I think, um, I, think I, uh, I had the rare, rare pleasure of uh, 
I had like a, a short trip to LA uh, last week uh, where I got to do a handful of really enjoyable things. I got to visit the, the chemosphere, the Lordner House uh, at Billington Tashin. I got to see, uh, I visited Nathan Crowley, the production designer of, of The Dark Knight, and got to see some of his hand-built models of the Batmobile. Uh, and then I got to meet Quincy Jones. Uh, and uh, Quincy Jones was spending the day on a, uh, he had like this uh, sports um, uh, drinking bottle from, uh, from the bicycle uh, that had like a special mixture of some kind of herbal, herbal Brazilian thing and, uh, and, a, and a very sort of specific uh, Brazilian vodka. Uh, and as the day uh, advanced, he got more and more um, uh, prophetic. Uh, and uh, at some point, um, uh, he was just telling me, like, he was constantly, he was like this sort of constantly like, telling all these stories about, you know, all the, all the like amazing people he's been hanging out with and all the things he's been doing. And I said, like, it was amazing that beyond music that he's done so much. Uh, and then he says, yeah, but you know that, you know, like, if you can combine uh, the emotional and the intellectual, then you can do anything. And, and I think, uh, of course, I talk a lot about um, why things work and where they come from. Uh, but I think uh, Darwinian evolution is not only uh, you know, mechanical uh, utilitarian, it's not only uh, that you know, the giraffe can reach uh, uh, the higher leaves, so therefore it gets the, the, the long neck or the turtle doesn't get eaten because it has a panza, like this sort of predator-prey arms race. A major component uh, in evolution is uh, female mating preference, uh, which is that peacock, female peacocks prefer male peacocks with uh, tons of feathers that are very long and uh, highly unpractical and, and actually super dangerous to drag around in the jungle because uh, <laughs> you can really get eaten if you're dragging that much feather around. Uh, uh, so I think in that sense, uh, in the middle of all this, uh, uh, a major element in the architectural evolution that occurs within the office is, of course, uh, our own personal satisfaction. Uh, and, and I think, I, I like uh, maybe, um, maybe to finish off, I think uh, architecture is very much like portraiture, painting a portrait. Uh, because I always uh, like to say that the uh, it's not going to be my building. It's not going to be our building. It's going to be the client's building or the user's building. So if, uh, if they don't want it, it's definitely not going to happen. And if they don't love it, it's probably not going to last because they're not going to take good care of it. And they're going to hire another architect that's less difficult. And uh, he or she is going to fuck it up. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, or they're going to do it on their own. Like, uh, so I think in the end, the, just like a successful portrait, if you're painting or shooting sculpting a portrait of someone, it's your, as an artist, capacity to capture the essence of the character, the personality, the attributes, even unlock things that might be hidden or bring to light things that are unseen or secret about this person so that you can actually create uh, a portrait that, that is even more like the person than the person, uh, him or herself. Uh, and it's the same way in, uh, uh, in architecture. If you can sort of discover things that, uh, uh, that hadn't been identified, uh, sort of identify uh, new, new forms of behavior or potential or problems that hadn't been addressed, you, you won't end up blocking uh, the, sort of the social flow or the cultural flow or whatever flow through the world. You'll end up actually creating the framework around it and your work will bring to light, will manifest things that were otherwise uh, invisible and in the end, a beautiful portrait is both 100% the subject you're portraying and 100% the expression of the artist making it. So, so the answer was no. Uh, <laughs> okay.